balcony, and of course uh, the uh, balcony here behind me is where people ring the opening closing bell. Hello, everybody. Twitter and Facebook, Instagram as well. Everybody, YouTube as well. Happy to see everybody. Uh, a lot of craziness this week. A lot of volatility, and we got a lot of questions trying to explain, uh, trying me to ask me, could you explain exactly what's going on here? And I can do it. It'll take about a minute to explain what's happening. Uh, we have had uh, a tremendous year in the stock market, a uh, record year. But beginning of October, things got a little bit difficult. And it got difficult for real reasons, not imaginary reasons. Number one, it looked like the Federal Reserve was going to be aggressively raising rates in 2019. The stock market has a little bit of a problem with that because they think the economy is going to be somewhat slower in 2019. And so they don't want such aggressive rate hikes because it slows economic growth down. That was one problem. The second problem was trade and tariffs. The whole tariff issue, historically tariffs are bad for the global economy, bad for stock markets. There may be an ideological reasons why you want tariffs. The president has articulated that, but it's definitely bad for the global economy, bad for stock markets. Uh, that's the second problem. The third problem is global growth in general slowing down. Europe has not had a great year, fair, but not great. And China is slowing down. Independently of the whole trade war issue, China has been slowing down a little. Not dramatically, but it's still slowing down. And China is so big now, that affects the global economy. So throw in higher interest rates potentially from the Fed, throw in tariff issues, throw in slower global growth. And the stock market suddenly got into the fourth quarter and said, you know what? We've had the markets are at records here in the United States. Maybe we should take some money off the table. Selling begets more selling. Now, in the last week or two, we've had an additional issue, and that's some political risk. The Democrats are coming in in January into the House of Representatives. The president has, there appears to be a lot of chaos, I think is a fair word, in the White House. The president has, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis has resigned. That reverberated a lot because uh, Mattis was a widely respected figure. So what the markets want is stability. Stability at the Fed, stability at the White House, stability in global growth. And it's not getting that from anybody. So it's not a surprise when you see all of this volatility that's going on in the markets. Now, the question is, what happens when we get into 2019? There's a lot of end of the year gyrations going on. And the answer is, we don't know. But I can tell you this. We need to get a little bit of a resolution about where we're going with interest rate hikes. My guess is the Fed is not going to be as aggressive as they thought they were going to be. That's going to be good news. Number two, my guess is some deal will be made on tariffs. It's not clear. The president has articulated that he wants some kind of longer term uh, deal with China about intellectual property theft, which has been a very real issue over the years and a number of presidents have tackled uh, generally unsuccessfully. Again, this gets complicated, but some resolution there would be a big help to the market. And finally, just figuring out how much global growth is slowing or not would be a big help. So imagine this. The stock market is not about what's happening now. This, you could say, hey, the economy looks pretty good. The economy does look pretty good. But the stock market's a discounting mechanism. It's trying to figure out what global growth is going to look like in the middle of next year. It's not worried about now. And we don't know. And you can't plug in a model of, Okay, here's my companies that I cover. Here's what I think the earnings are going to be in 2019. They don't know because they have all of these uncertainty. That's why the stock market is acting so weird these days. Let me just stop there and ask Laura if we've got any other questions because I want to address one other issue a little bit later, and that's all these issue about machine trading that you hear a lot about. But, Laura, what else do we uh, want to talk well, about? Well, a lot of questions about the Fed and interest rates. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what to expect next year? Yeah. Um, Laura was saying about the Fed. Uh, and interest rates. So in the beginning of October, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve, um, Mr. Powell, came out and said that uh, his, the, the committee in the Federal Open Market Committee looked like they were going to raise rates three times next year in addition to once in December. Now, they did raise in December, quarter point, and this was not terribly surprising given the strength of the U.S. economy. But the market reacted very negatively to comments that indicated they were going to keep hiking, uh, on average, three more hikes in 2019. I think that you are going to see, uh, in December, we indicated that the Fed is now down to thinking they might hike, on average, amongst all the members, two times in 2019. I think you're going to see that go down in the next few months to probably one time. So I think the market's going to get what it wants on the interest rate situation. The broader question is, 
why are our interest rates still relatively low? You have to remember, the United States competes for interest rates all over the world with other countries. So right now, the 10-year the yield is 2.7%. You know, you might think that's pretty low, and it is historically, but you go to Japan, where it's flat to negative. You go to Europe, where the 10-year German yield, this is Germany, biggest economy, is 0.3%, something like that. Think about that. So if you're a major pension company and you need to buy long-term bonds, are you going to buy German bonds at 10-year at 0.3%? Are you going to buy U.S. Treasury bonds at 2.7%? What do you think the answer is? You're going to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. And not just the Americans. The Germans are buying U.S. Treasury bonds. The Chinese are buying U.S. Treasury bonds. And this is one reason why our yields have been kept down. People keep saying, why doesn't the 10-year yield go up? The two-year, which the Federal Reserve controls because they control short-term rates, that's been going up this year. But the 10-year has been kind of flat. And one of the main reasons is people around the world are coming to buy our bonds because we get the best yields of anybody. That's artificially depressing prices. And I don't know how long that's going to last. Tell me how long it's going to be 0% on a 10-year in Japan, and I'll tell you how long people are going to compete here and buy our stuff. I suspect it's going to be a while. So this is leading a lot of people to say long-term yields probably are not going to go up as fast as people thought a year or two years ago. I don't know how fast. Also, there are signs that inflation in the United States is still relatively contained. The Fed still has about a 2% inflation rate. Now, I know people write in all the time, Bob, education costs are going up faster than 2%. My health care costs are going up. And you're right. There are pockets that are going up faster. But if you look at other things, hardware, technology goods, they're actually deflating. You're getting more for your money now than you did three or four years ago. I know that's hard to believe, but think of how much more sophisticated the stuff you're buying is now in technology than it was a few years ago. And in a lot of cases, the prices are actually going down. What else do we want to talk about? Do you want to talk a little bit about what happened on Wednesday with the market, the record um, point gain for the Dow? Yeah. How can we... So uh, Laura was asking about these crazy moves in the Dow. On Wednesday, you move 800 points. You move 1,000 points the next day or the other way around. There's a lot of end-of-the-year things going on here. So remember what's happened going into the last week of December. Traditionally, the last two weeks of December are up times. One of the reasons it's up is that traditionally you'll see people who have what's called tax loss selling in the first half of December. So they sell all their losers. Then generally that gets exhausted and they start that, that goes away and people start trying to pick better performer stocks for 2019. And traditionally, the second half of December is an up part of the month. And usually, December is usually an up month overall. This has not happened this year. Number one, there was a tremendous amount of tax loss selling because October and November were bad months. So going in, and you could see stocks that had been down a lot in the S&P 500, they went down even more in the first. That, that tells you that investors are taking those stocks the GEs of the world for example that have been killed and they're just selling them even more to take tax losses on them that is finally starting to abate number one number two we had really oversold conditions because of these problems I talked about before the China slowing concerns about the Fed concerns about tariffs so the market was down dramatically and normally when you have those kinds of drops in the market it tends to bounce back it, it tends to overshoot so oversold conditions number one number two tax loss selling finally abating number three you have a lot of people who are out uh, pension funds that are out that have to rebalance it towards the end of the year so if you are a pension fund and you have 60 percent of your assets in stocks and 40 percent in bonds going into the third quarter or the fourth quarter excuse me suddenly you have because of the stock market decline you're 50 percent stocks and 50 percent in bonds and you have to rebalance you have to buy more stock to get back to 60 percent we saw yesterday programs that clearly indicated likely pension funds were coming in and selling bonds which had been going up and buying stocks which had been going down to rebalance their portfolio this gets very technical it's hard to figure out but the point is those are not fundamental moves. Those are simply firms that are rebalancing. All this is good news because it's a way of saying when stuff gets too far out of whack, people tend to come in 
and start buying or even start selling. It goes the other way around. The other thing I think we should address right now is uh, machines. It's a very common phrase that you'll hear. The machines have taken over. That was all completely crazy. Oh, it's all algorithms. The world has changed. 23 years ago, when I came down here on the floor, right behind me, there were 5,000 men and women on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. They had 80% of all the volume that trade in all NYSE stocks traded right here on the floor. Today, there's 500 people on the floor, 5,000 to 500, and they have 20% of the volume. From 80% of the volume in 1997, what I got here, to 20% of the volume, okay? What's happened to the rest of it? Well, it went to other exchanges. The Nasdaq's had a similar issue. And, uh, of course, electronic trading has occurred. So this is very disconcerting to a lot of people, but it's understandable. So now, let me say 20 years ago, if I decided, I had a fund, and I said, you know what, if the S&P, excuse me, if the Dow drops below 23,000, I'm going to sell half of my portfolio. Because to me, that's a warning sign the market's going to go lower. Okay, so the Dow drops below 23,000. What does this guy do? He calls his broker up and he says, start selling stocks. And they would call down on the floor here and they'd start selling stocks. And this would take a while to get this guy's order through, maybe a few hours. Today, you could put an order in electronically using an algorithm that will insert itself right into the market at the exact moment the, S, the, the, S, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average hits 23,000. And in a microsecond, and I'm talking a microsecond, I mean a subsecond, you can sell a whole bunch of stuff. Now, if everyone has the same idea and says, you know what, 500 people, 500 accounts say, if Dow drops below 20,000, we're selling. And everybody hits that button at the same time, and the same order is executed at the same moment. Guess what happens? You get the market going down on a lot of volume. And that's what we've seen a lot recently. All of a sudden, you hit these certain levels, and the market moves. What does that tell you? First of all, it tells you a lot of people have the same idea. It's what we call crowded trades. There's not that much originality out there. I'm sorry. It's Wall Street. And so people do things that they think is going to protect their portfolios or save them money. This is what causes a lot of the chaos. But bear something in mind. It's disconcerting that the market drops suddenly, but it's an expression of what people want. They want to sell. And when people want to sell, they'll find a way to sell. In 1997, they'd call down on the floor and they'd tell their broker to start selling. It would take a few hours to get things done, but they still got it done. I don't care if you throw rocks at people or if you execute an order through some electronic program, it's still people selling. That's the point, and it's still people buying. So don't kid yourself. Yes, it's a little disconcerting that everything happens really fast, but that's the way modern life is. Don't you notice it? Don't you notice this, the pace of change has picked up? I'm an old guy, but 25-year-olds, they know it too. Millennials can see it too. 28-year-olds think the 20-year-olds uh, have a different mindset because things have changed so much. So the stock market is simply reflecting the pace of change. What else, Laura? So, Bob, the main question on everybody's mind is recession risk. Do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about yeah. um, what we might expect? Yeah, the recessions. Okay, so uh, what's the chance of a recession? Uh, there's two things that kill stock markets, historically. One is the Federal Reserve raises rates too fast, and it stops the stock market. The second is recessions. Recession is a great stock market killer. Are we going into a recession? The short answer is, it sure does not look like it immediately. But I'll throw the button in a minute. Remember something. We haven't had a recession in 10 years. It's been since the Great Recession, and that was a bad one. That was, a re that was one of the worst recessions since, since the Depression. The Fed has helped by keeping rates low. Now they're starting to unwind that. So my point of bringing this up, we're due for a slowdown. We're due for a stock market slowdown. The stock market hasn't gone down in 10 years. The only down year we've had in 10 years is 2000, 2015, and we were down 0.7%. That is not statistically significant. Don't kid yourself. Essentially, stock market's done nothing but go up for 10 years. That's weird. We don't have patterns like that. This is one of the greatest bull markets ever. And so there's a thing in statistics called reversion to the mean. Stuff doesn't always go up. Stuff doesn't always go down. In the long term, you get a reversion to the mean. So we're due for a flat to down year. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Even without the tariffs, without the China slowing down, without the Fed running, 
the economy normally just slows down. Now, let me just talk about the recession. Recessions are only declared after they actually happen, so it's, it's a little crazy. But the stock market tries to guess these things. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they get it too early. My sense is, look, um, you know, a consecutive decline in GDP, which is what a recession is, mm, probably not in 2019, probably not. But the stock market, remember, is a discounting mechanism. It's trying to figure out what's going to happen in the second half of 2019 and into 2020 right now. And that's hard. It's signaling that it's concerned. But I personally, if you had to put a gun to my head and said, we hit a recession in 2019, no. Anything else? Yeah, so the last question um, that people wanted to know, if you're not an active investor, why should you care so much about yeah. volatility? Okay, so that's a good question. If you're not an active investor, why should you care about volatility? You, the reason it's important is when you get gyrations of this type in the stock market, it affects overall sentiment. So look uh, at consumer sentiment. We actually, you know, we do these surveys of business people. Um, we call it the Institute for Supply Management. They survey manufacturers and say, how's business? They literally do that. They say, how's business? And they you fill out a form. Here's how business is. We're hiring. We're not hiring. Um, we're getting lots of orders. We're not getting any orders. And they go out and survey people in the job market. You're getting a job, not getting a job, still looking, you're not looking, what do you think is going on? And they go out and survey consumers. How do you feel about your personal circumstances? How do you feel about things in the United States, the, the prospects for economic growth? So consumer sentiment, and a number of these what we call sentiment indicators, has slowed down recently. Now, I want you to know that these numbers are at historic highs. Like, we've had an amazing run. The, the, these numbers are way above normal, so they're now coming down. And like I said, this is that reversion to the mean. It's normal to have that happen. But when you get really crazy moves, like we've had, December's been a crazy month in the stock market. I've been doing this a long time. It's, trust me, it's a crazy month. It'll go down in history. They'll be studying this for decades this month. When you get that, people, even people who are not involved in the stock market start saying, what the hell's going on? Does, does this mean that uh, the economy is going gonna, is gonna to go into a recession or slow down? Or they get, it makes people a little more nervous. So the reason you should care about it is this is all a mind game. It's not a con game. That's a little too cynical, even by my standards. It's a mind game. A lot of this is you believe things are pretty good, you're going to go out and buy that car. You don't believe it, you say, nah, maybe I can just hang on to my car for another year. So just remember the gyrations in the stock market get into the general news flow and people start saying oh the economy's slowing down gee maybe i shouldn't do anything maybe i don't need that new watch that's why it's important for you anything else one last question one last question you can skip this one if you want lots of people want to know where you got your suit <laughs> where did i get my suit <laughs> um i go <laughs> just should i say <laughs> uh, for many, many years, uh, I went to Saks Fifth Avenue, the sixth floor, the men's floor, for 15 years, uh, one of the great men's stores in America. In the last several years, I have bought my suits at Rothman's. Rothman's is a boutique men's store uh, on 16th and Park Avenue, and they do wonderful stuff. Uh, it's very difficult to do a boutique store, a boutique anything, a boutique uh, women's store, a boutique bookshop a boutique men's store. Why is it difficult? Because boutique is curated. You don't have the sixth floor Saks is literally a city block long. I'm not joking. It's that big. They have everything. But you're doing a boutique. You're just in a little space. You have to curate that in a way that appeals to the largest number of people and essentially shows off what good taste you have. Because I can't have 5,000 suits in, in that kind of store. They can only have a few hundred. So. A lot of the success is how good the people in the store are at picking the stuff that people really like. And I think Rothman's is one of the best. Thank you all. It's been one heck of a year. Uh, this is my 28th year at CNBC, and uh, I'll be around for 2019 as well. It's a great privilege to be down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange.